So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming at the French Embassy tonight. We are very pleased to see you here for this after lab. Uh, today, I'm very pleased with the team uh, of CNRS and also French Embassy and um, French Chamber of Commerce. Welcome our speaker, Claude Gay, for this French Lab a session about uh, fusion for clean energy. If you have any question here, please feel free to raise your hand and Claude here can respond directly uh, for the question. And online, if you have any question, uh, you can also uh, put your question in the chat box and we will take your question during the presentation or at the end of the presentation. So this presentation is recorded. You will see also the presentation, full presentation on French Lab website. Thank you everyone and uh, enjoy this session. Claude, yeah, Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, Thank you to, to the French Lab for giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, actually to discuss uh, about uh, fusion for clean energy. So the way I would like to do this presentation is first give the context, both you know, globally but also locally here in Singapore. Why is it a timely to discuss of fusion. And then I will just go and uh, do at a really layman level, you know, what do we mean? What is fusion? What are the opportunities which fusion can bring? So. Sure. Oh, oh, yes, that would be very, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> So, uh, I mean, the last uh, report from the international uh, panel on climate changes actually leaves no room for optimism. No anthropogenic uh, gas emission uh, present today a very, very severe condition to the ecosystem. I mean, conditions which are unprecedented for, for several millennia. What it has shown is uh, that the greenhouse gas emission actually continue to grow. And uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, is, is, as we know all, is a major contributor you know, to this uh, man-made greenhouse gas. So, Anthropogenic uh, carbon dioxide originates mainly from you know, the burning of fossil fuels, about 90%. What does it mean? It means that energy is the main culprit for greenhouse gas emission. This is one thing. But uh, paradoxically, I mean, a massive reduction of carbon dioxide will lead to a demand, an increasing demand for electricity. And that's easy to understand because there will be, you know, we will replace oil for transport, for instance, by electricity. So it means that uh, it's really timely. And it's essential to increase the contribution of renewable energy for electricity uh, production. However, I mean, most of forecasts show that despite that it's increasing quite fast, it will not reach 50% of electricity generation by 2050. And uh, you can see on this. Uh, here, oh, sorry. You see, I mean, we still have oh, come on. natural gas, coal, which contribute you know, to a very large extent. When we look on the uh, right and the graph, these are the renewable energy with a projection. I mean, that's the present situation. So renewable today is mainly 
dominated by hydropower. So wind and solar uh, are a small contribution. It will raise, uh, but even so, you know, it will not even give the total part of the renewable energy. So why do I show this? Is, uh, because renewable energy alone really cannot meet the overall carbon-free uh, demand. And this is, there are a few reasons for that. Very poor predictability you know, of wind in particular, uh, seasonal and daily fluctuation, this is obvious for solar uh, energy, geographical context, I mean, it changed from one country to the other. And uh, something which is important is the limitation of storage. Storage is the main issue today for renewable energy. So this means that renewable energy need to be combined with you know, carbon-free base. There is one base load which is actually renewable and this is hydropower. And then you need to have them, you need to have high elevation reservoirs and this will not be sufficient because you cannot, in Singapore, we will not have hydropower, definitely. So in the absence of massive hydropower, only nuclear energy can ensure an efficient base. Alternatively, this is also a possibility which is considered. We could keep gas as a base load, but then we would need you know, carbon capture and storage of carbon. But these technologies are understudied, but not so promising. And they are very expensive. So, I mean, since we are at the French embassy, I would like to take the example of you know, France, where in fact 90% of electricity production does not emit uh, any CO2. And the reason for this is that 75% of electricity generation is from nuclear. And then we have another about 14% uh, from renewable energy, but most of this, about 10%, is hydropower. Okay. So this is, uh, let's say, the, the, the global. Uh, Situation. Now, what is the Singapore context? Uh, in fact, it's interesting because about three weeks, four weeks ago, there was a report from the Energy Market Authority, and this expert study uh, has affirmed that net zero carbon emission you know, is feasible by 2050, but within some conditions. And is to, so what they, they recommend is to pre-position Singapore for new low carbon supply uh, alternative. I mean, the situation here for renewable is not so good. There is no, no wind because essentially we are on the equator, wind is very weak and uh, solar is limited. I think a fair number is probably maybe we could reach 10% of electricity from solar. So that's a small fraction. So given that Singapore has this limited option to decarbonize its uh, our sector, what is recommended uh, is monitor developments in new supply. And this is carbon capture, use and storage. Uh, that's something which I recommend to study. This again would mean that we could accept gas you know, as a base load, geothermal energy, power methane. And, and that's interesting, they say nuclear fission with SMR. So SMR, this is small modular reactors, uh, one thing, and nuclear fusion technologies. I'm just quoting you know, this report, and this is that new nuclear power plant designs are, are being developed and tested. And in fact, this is, I would say, in, uh, in France. Uh, the USA, in Russia, and in China, uh, have the potential to be much safer than many of the plants that are in operation today. And, and is viable, these uh, safer technologies could provide you know, Singapore with a scalable and carbon-free base load of electricity.
Why can't I move that? I'm sorry. Maybe I can do like that, no? Okay, so the second context, which is local, is again, is that uh, the Temasek holding, which is a foreign form here uh, in Singapore, has set on fusion for clean energy. And I mean, in two ways. One, they have invested 65 million US dollars you know, in a company in Vancouver, in Canada, which is working on fusion. And it is one of the five, I mean, principal uh, private companies which are active in this field. The second reason is that in addition to this, they say there is a need for capacity building in Singapore. And uh, they awarded NTU, you know, a fusion chair uh, professorship. So the objective, as I say, is capacity building, enabling, you know, Singapore to keep abreast with ongoing progress in fusion science and technology, and, and be ready to participate in the development of some, I mean, this is demonstrator, or if we are a little more modest, maybe specific components of the demonstrator. So our proposal was to say, uh, I put it on our bit, we, we would like to focus this chair because there is no uh, skill today, no uh, competences in Singapore. So let's focus the chair on vertical and computational plasma physics for, 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 for fusion. So the idea is that, I mean, this is absolutely needed. I will come back later on this. And let's have this backed, you know, by a strong partnership with an overseas uh, uh, institution. And this institution is a CEA. CEA has, you know, very long experience in nuclear, both in fission and in fusion. And, you know, the DNA of fission is really, of the CEA is really from research, basic research uh, to industry. So, uh, so this uh, Temasek uh, chair now is on place at uh, NTU. The chair professor has been hired. So is uh, Xavier Garbé is from CEA. He, he, he will come in, uh, in, in August this year. And two young assistant professors, both of them are very bright, have also been uh, appointed. Okay, so, I mean, this has been formalized actually last year, uh, and this was during the Committee for Science Singapore, French Committee for Science and Innovation, COSINIX, I think we call it, and uh, this was in June 24, so it was signed by uh, uh, NTU and CEA in the presence of both, I mean, the Deputy Prime Minister from Singapore, and, and the French Minister of Higher Education and Research. And clearly, as you can see here, the scientific and technological research topic promoted by this uh, MOU aim at building skills in Singapore in the field of magnetic fusion, that's really the choice, the option at CEA uh, uh, for clean energy. And they include theoretical and computational plasma physics. This is the Thomas Temasek chair design, delivery, and installation of plasma diagnostic on the West Tokamak facility. So this is a Tokamak facility. I will discuss later what is a Tokamak. Uh, to do experimental studies at CD. Uh, OK, so this was the context. Now uh, I would like to come to fusion. But, uh, fusion is a nuclear process. So I'm not sure that all of you are really experts in nuclear physics. So I will give you a course in nuclear physics in one slide. <laughs> and uh, so uh, 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 nucleus, atomic uh, nucleus, is a bound system, it's a quantum bound system of particles called nucleons. So there are protons and protons have a positive electric charge. 
there are neutrons, neutrons of electrically neutral. What you have to remember is that there are three forces which are at work in a nucleus. There is a strong force of Aaron's call, and this force is holding the nucleus together. The strength of this force is, let's say, one. And the range of this force is very small. It's 10 to the minus 15 uh, 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 meter, which means a, a billionth, a million for the million for the millimeter. So this is about the size of the nucleus. So you can see, I mean, the size of the atom is of the order of an angstrom, so which is about 100,000 larger than the size of the nucleus. Then there is another force acting in the nucleus. This is, you know it very well. This is the electro electromagnetic force. And the strength is smaller, is one over 137 of the strong force. And its range you know, is infinite. Two charged particles and other force, which uh, is of infinite range. And there is a third force acting in the nucleus. This is a weak force. And probably you have heard of it uh, in the last year because of the discovery of the W built boson, you know, etc. This weak force, as the name says, is responsible, it is responsible for beta decay, for radioactivity. It's very weak. It's 10 to the minus six that is present, and its range is very, very small. 10 to the minus 18 meters, uh, 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 much smaller than strong force. So maybe just another thing I need to tell you about nuclear is that. Uh, an element in the Mendeleev table is characterized by uh, the charge, by the number of protons, huh? but, but there are different isotopes of the elements. So one element can have, it does necessarily the same number of protons, but it can have a different number of neutrons. And these are called isotopes. So isotopes have the same chemical properties, because this is given by the uh, electric charge, but they are very different nuclear properties. So for instance, in hydrogen, and uh, you will see why I mentioned this, we have three isotopes. One is uh, uh, normal hydrogen, which you know. One is deuterium, which is uh, heavy hydrogen, which you get from heavy water. And the third one is tritium. In one case, one proton, no neutron, this is stable. Deuteron is one neutron, one neutron, one proton, one neutron. This is stable. And the triton, one neutron, one proton, two neutron. And this is not stable because it beta decays. What is the origin of nuclear energy? Why do we get nuclear energy from? The reason is that uh, you all know, you know, from the Einstein formula, that the energy huh, is the mass times the uh, velocity of light squared, e equal mc squared. Now, if I take the mass of uh, nuclei per nucleon, so I take the mass of the, of the nucleus and I divide by the total number of nucleons, and I, I, and, and I look how it varies with the size of the uh, nucleus. So you see there is a minimum here, and this corresponds to, the, to iron. This is iron origin, and this is why iron is very abundant you know, on Earth. What is interesting here is there is a sharp decrease of mass here as the size goes, in, uh, goes uh, increased. So it means if I fuse two light nuclei into you know, a bit ever one to make a there will be a loss of mass, but energy must be conserved. So that means this loss of mass has to be compensated by emission of energy, releasing of energy. So this is where fusion occurs. It's interesting that on the other side, because of this minimum here, if I consider a heavy nucleus, let's say like uranium, uh, and assume that we can split 
this uh, heavy nucleus into two fragments, which are maybe something here. Then is the same thing. There will be a loss of mass, so this will be accompanied by you know the release of energy. So uh, but, I mean fusion cannot uh, occur spontaneously, otherwise I mean, there would be no hydrogen, there would be no light nuclei. And what is the reason for that? Is the electromagnetic force, which I mentioned before, which is acting at long distances. And uh, so if I assume I have a, a fixed proton here and I have an incoming proton here, you know, as it approaches, it feeds this electrostatic repulsion. And there is what we call, uh, oops, 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 what happened here? This is, there is something what we call a barrier huh? and which prevent you know, the fusion. So if you want to make fusion in the laboratory, you have to pass over this barrier huh? and to bring you know, energy to, to, to overcome this barrier before this incoming proton falls into the well and we are able to fuse with the, the other protons. So, So maybe just a small digression about, uh, uh, about fission, only one slide, uh, just to give you some number. So the fission process, as I said, is essentially an uranium isotope 235, which absorbs a neutron, and this will split uh, the, the, the nucleus into two fragments, both of them are radioactive, and these are the waste which we do you all know about because you cannot do anything of them. They are just waste of the reaction. And, but there is also neutrons emitted. So since there is neutron emitted, the neutron can induce a new fission and this is the chain reaction. So that's how the fission reactor works. To have numbers, I mean, the complete fission of one kilogram of uranium 235, this isotope, not natural uranium. National uranium contains only 0.8% of uranium 235. But one kilogram of uranium 235 yields 24 gigawatt hour, which is equivalent to 2,700 tons of coal. So you see, I mean, the change of scale. Okay, now what about uh, uh, fusion? So we always say fusion. Uh, can we realize fusion on Earth because fusion works in the sun? Yes. In fact, uh, all energy we have you know, on Earth comes from fusion in the sun. So how does fusion in the sun work? It's the fusion of two protons. They fuse, they uh, create a deut uh, deuteron, one proton, and they emit one electron and one neutron. This means that the force which is acting here is a weak force, okay? So, I mean, some numbers are interesting. About 4 million tons, 4 million tons of the mass of the sun you know, is converted into heat and radiation every second. So, should we worry about this? Not really. I mean, because this could go for another billion years. And before, I mean, the fuel uh, hydrogen is exhausted. So uh, it works in the sun and it cannot work on Earth because of the extreme condition in the sun. One is, is temperature, which is 15 million degrees C. That's not a problem because we can even do better, you know, in the laboratory. But in the sun, because of the very strong gravitational forces. You know, the pressure is 150 billion bar. And this you could not achieve you know, on, uh, on, on Earth. So on Earth, uh, we need much higher reaction probabilities. Uh, and this requires to take advantage of the strong force. So on Earth, essentially, I mean, the most favorable fission reaction is between the deuteron 
of I, I put uh, in a triton, so it's two isotopes of hydrogen. It's fused, and the product are uh, helium, helium four, which we also call alpha particle, and a neutron. And the energy release uh, uh, we used to in nuclear physics. I mean, also in physics, we uh, express you know energy in electron volt, and so in the nuclear case, usually we speak in million of electron volt MeV. So it's about 18 MeV per reaction. So the fuel here is deuterium and tritium. Uh, deuterium is plentiful. I mean, you heavy water is about one six thousand, you know, of normal water. So you can extract uh, deuterium from water. So there is no problem. However. Tritium is unstable, so you don't get tritium on Earth. And it has an half life of 12 years, so it must be produced by a nuclear reaction. So the nuclear reaction has to occur in the fusion reactor. And this is done by having lithium blanket inside the reactor. And the neutrons, you know, here, these 14 MeV neutrons, can react with both isotopes of lithium, lithium-6 and lithium-7, to produce tritium. So in the reactor, you produce tritium. This, of course, requires you know, extracting this tritium and so on, but these are technological issues, serious issues. And lithium is widely available you know, in rocks and ocean. So the fuel is not an issue, correct? So also some numbers, I just did that uh, uh, for Singapore, 15 grams of DT fuel, it's not so much, huh? is sufficient to produce the electricity of a Singapore citizens for 80 years, essentially for his whole life, 50 grams. Oh, maybe, I, yeah, something, I mean, of course I have to look at which uh, energy, uh, relative energy, is this uh, uh, reaction the most probable? And if you see, this is a log log scale. So it varies very quickly. And the maximum is at temperatures above 150 million degrees C. So that's quite large, correct? So, so the challenge is how do you get this very high temperature in the laboratory. So you have to create for this what we call a plasma, huh, which consists of moving ions uh, and electrons, free electrons. It's also called the fourth state of matter. There are, uh, you see on this graph, huh, uh, where is the temperature on the y-axis and, so, and the density on the x-axis, we have different types of plasma. So plasmas we are interested in here are either you know in this range eh? because we want a temperature uh, which is above 150 uh, million K. We have to confine this plasma eh? because it cannot come in contact with a material wall, eh? 150 million degree. So there are two approaches. Uh, to main approaches, there is variance, but there are essentially two main routes uh, to, uh, to, to fusion. One is magnetic confinement fusion, and I'm just giving some examples. This is there, we will show later, uh, in France, east in, uh, in China, uh, uh, west in France, in Calabash, and jet in UK. And there is uh, the other route, it's complicated. This is inertial confinement fusion. And uh, there are two big examples. One is a national ignition facility at Hidomor. And the second one is the uh, laser mega LNG, you know, in France. So I will explain how both are working. So magnetic confinement first. This is the most promising. And that's the one we wish to work on. What you know, I mean, from your high school uh, course in physics, 
uh, is that uh, in a straight and uniform magnetic line, the charged particle follow uh, helical path, you know, uh, around the, the, the magnetic field line. The electrons, which I read much faster uh, than the ion, but with a much smaller radius. Some of you remember this. So you have to show the magnetic field such that the ion radius of generation is much smaller than the dimension of the dimension of the device. So typically it would be something of the order one centimeter, which means that the electrons maybe could be a tenth of a millimeter. Uh, so the simplest magnetic geometry would be just a straight cylinder. And that does not work because the particles, you know, will escape at both ends. So if you want to prevent them to escape at both ends, just swing it huh, into a donor shape. And that's what you do here. But you see uh, is that the coils are narrower in the inner part than in the outer part. And this will create, so the magnetic field in, uh, at the inner part will be larger. So there will be a gradient of, uh, of the magnetic field, and this will lead the particle to escape. So that's not good enough. So, so in fact, the solution was found quite a long time ago, huh? and, and it's, uh, it's called tokamak. So there is some uh, uh, extra field, you know, which correct for this uh, uh, gradient of, uh, of magnetic field, preventing the, uh, the, the charge particle to escape. Or there is something which we call stellarator, which is a very funny shape, you know, of the magnetic field. I cannot go into the details because definitely uh, you will get bored, I think. So. What is the challenge with this uh, is that because this is, uh, this was, uh, I mean, Tokamak was invented uh, 60 years ago, almost 60 years ago. And uh, we are still working uh, on trying to have an inclusion uh, uh, in the laboratory, even with more energy than we could. So the main reason is that all this system. Uh, show very strong turbulences. Huh? So we have to work uh, against this. This requires the uh, plasma density to be very, and thus to have a very large volume for, for, uh, of the machine, which you know, contains this plasma, if we are going to produce electricity. So, as an example, we will see later the volume of the ether uh, device of the plasma is 830 cubic meters. So it means, and there is only in this three grams of DT fuel, which means that the density is about you know, three ten to the minus six uh, of the air density, three ten to the minus six, very, very low density. And so the common thing, I mean, of course, we have to isolate uh, the plasma from the changeable walls. Huh? And so to figure out uh, the best no leak confinement. There is a criterion which was also expressed quite a long time ago by a, a physicist by the name of Lawson, and this is called the Lawson criterion. So this is a criterion which collects three parameters. The density of the of the plasma, the uh, energy confinement time of the plasma, and the temperature of the uh, plasma, uh, and, and the product of these three, three parameters has to be larger than this number. And what I show on this figure is the progress which has been achieved. I mean, uh, so it has to be larger than ten to the minus twenty one. Uh, let's say 10 to the minus 20, so this is the objective for ITER. Uh, uh, and when all this started in the 60s, uh, we were at 10 to the 17. So there is indeed you know, a, a clear fast rise, and we are approaching uh, what we call ignition. 
So now, uh, what is inner soul confinement? It's totally different. Inner soul confinement is that you have here the in oops, inside a, inside what we call a whole room. It's, it's a small box, metallic box, maybe of the size of a box of matches, like that. And you have a very small capsule of about spherical, of about one centimeter diameter, which contains a, it's a, the fuel, the DT, the dilution fuel. Then you shine with a high energy laser, a lot of energy laser, uh, and at uh, this leave facility, the liver is 180 laters. If you shine all of them inside this small box, and um, this way, uh, you create you know, X rays, very intense free X rays, which will act on the uh, capsule inside the box and compress it to now densities which are about 100 times the density of lead. So now we have a plasma, which is a very, very high density, in many years. And, uh, and, 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 and that, that's the way uh, you will uh, produce ignition. So now fusion in the sun and on Earth. Uh, it's interesting to compare. I mean, the confinement on sun is gravitational, as we said. Magnetic confinement, like ITER, you know, uh, is, uh, it is magnetic. NIF is inertial. Duration, billion of years for, for, for the sun, 15 minutes for ITER, and a billion for second for, for inertial confinement. Density, about one gram per cubic centimeter in the sun, billion or 0.5 billions of grams per cubic centimeter for magnetic and very high dens uh, density for inertia. Temperatures are about similar. I mean, it can be, it, the sun is lower by a factor of 10, but uh, magnetic and inertia have about the same uh, temperature. Power density, I mean, uh, quite low, I mean, mentioned weak force in the sun, very high uh, in the magnetic uh, confinement. And this is not, not discussed in the case of inertia. And galactic distance, as what also have said before. I mean, one million kilometers for, for the sun, 10 meters, something like that, for, for magnetic, and one centimeter for inertia. So if I compare fission and fusion in the, in the context of Singapore, so uh, the reactor technologies for, for fission and safety measures are well in the world. I mean, this should be a Understood. However, I mean, the minor risk of a major accident huh, may have very heavy consequences in a small uh, uh, environment, city uh, like Singapore. Uh, fusion, I mean, the progress uh, uh, and, uh, needed before fusion reactor potterac could be operational or for the future. Huh? Uh, so, Fission produce long lived highly radioactive uh, uh, waste. Fusion does not have any you know, radiation legacy. There is no risk of meltdown, uh, no, uh, uh, and no risk for associated illness. The availability of uh, fuel for fusion is, uh, is not an issue, uh, as we have seen. Whereas it is uh, for, for fission because it relies on the availability of uranium. So maybe uh, the ITER project, uh, in a, just a few words, I mean, uh, this is under construction. This will be operational. It was supposed to be operational in 2025, but I think before, because of you know, the present situation, uh, it may be delayed a bit. Uh, I encourage you to read uh, this paper uh, published in Nature by Bernard Hugo, uh, who is the uh, general director. So, what is the project there? Huh? Is that the Q? Well, the Q is the ratio 
over the energy you have produced, over the energy needed to build the plasma. Yeah? So it should be two should be definitely larger than one. And uh, so uh, objective of ether is Q larger than 10 to produce 500 megawatt power uh, for pulses of 400 seconds to demonstrate the, uh, the operation, iterative operation of technology for a fusion power plant. To do it, there will be the burning plasma, the deuterium nutrition, in which uh, uh, the reaction is sustained by the internal heating. Huh? I mentioned fusion to test you know, tri uh, tritium grading and, and to demonstrate the safety you know, of a fusion device. Okay. Maybe I can skip this, but just you know, these are big numbers and to show that it's really a giant machine. And this is not a really reactor which will be capable to the way. This is an experiment huh, to demonstrate the feasibility of fusion. Uh, I mean, what is very impressive is a uh, magnet uh, system, again, with very large number, 10,000 tons of magnets, uh, uh, a magnetic energy of 51 gigajoules, which is stored. Uh, so technology is based on superconducting niobium tin uh, magnet cooled with super critical helium at 4 Kelvin. So you have 4 Kelvin on one side and inside, outside, and you have uh, 150 million uh, degree you know, in the dust. So this is very large grain. So, what is today's best achievement in, uh, uh, in fusion? I think this is the machine, and it was publicized uh, recently at Jet in the UK, and where they produce 59 megajoules of heat energy from fusion for about five seconds. And the ratio to Q value was only 0.3. But this is a very uh, important result, and as it was quoted by Bernard Digo, and for the ITER project, the JET results of a strong confidence figure that we are in the right track as we move forward toward demonstrating full fusion power. So, so the conservative Conservative route towards uh, commercially viable fusion is this: is that we are, now we are at ITER, and then after ITER, I mean the idea is for about ten years of experiment at ITER. Then with all the experiments that have been acquired at ITER, then we the idea is to uh, design, demonstrate, for demo, which will be then followed by the actors of the group. So typically. See, timeline is 2060. That's a conservative view uh, by, uh, let's say, institutions all over the world. Fusion starts up. Then, from the private sector, uh, say, oh, maybe we can go faster. And that's what I would like to discuss now. So, is fusion approaching commercial by And uh, what is interesting is that beside this institutional research, private fusion uh, firms have disclosed more than 2.4 billion US dollars in funding. And there are today maybe 30 companies working on uh, fusion technologies. I listed them, I will not go there. Uh, I will show two of them only. Uh, one I believe, oh yeah, maybe it's important to say, uh, they work on very different technological approach, magnetic confinement, which I've discussed, the mixture of magnetic and inertial, electrostatic, electrostatic confinement, inertial confinement, uh, non thermal laser fusion. And what is interesting is that no one is working on cold fusion. And you remember, uh, cold fusion was a shame for uh, all this research. So, this company, Commonwealth uh, Fusion System, is associated with the MIT. And I think that's a really very nice work. 
because what their success, uh, their success was to uh, engineer high temperature superconducting materials, which we have known the vacuum. That's a challenge with engineering. And this they could demonstrate that they could produce a magnetic field at the magnitude of about 20 Tesla to be compared to about 10 Tesla in ITER. Factor of two, factor of two in the magnetic field means two to the power of four, so factor of 16 is the power of the reactor. So it's a very interesting uh, result here. The other one, I mentioned it because that's where the uh, Temasek uh, holding has been invested. Uh, this is you know, general fusion, and it's a hybrid of magnetic inertial confinement fusion. And then there is uh, a, a jacket of, of uh, liquid metal, uh, you know, which is compressing the plasma and also absorbing the energy, which will be uh, transferred uh, and to uh, the system. So, uh, I mentioned uh, uh, two slides. I mentioned, uh, uh, you know, what we wish to do. So we have this joint research center, you know, between NTU and CA. The research will be, I mentioned, with the thematic share on theoretical uh, and computational plasma physics using AI and deep learning, and I mean, it's not only basic research, it's very fundamental to do this for operation and control of learning plasma. So this needs to be accompanied uh, by the diagnostic of the plasma. And this diagnostic, what we plan to do is to be diagnostic here in Singapore and bring them to the West Tokamak and Calabash for experiment. So we focus on my pet plasma and the area is over the vector light. Of course, we, well, we have to do capacity building in C uh, by uh, producing scientists and engineers. Right? So we are building uh, any contribution program. Right? And in particular, we have to do it with other C universities right? at the master and the PhD. Working with CA has a big advantage, you know, for, for Singapore because it brings them immediately, you know, in the international fusion network. <laughs> and both I mean, in France, of course, in Germany, in UK, in US, and because CA is working in all these international networks. So I will just finish this. Who will win? The race for fusion for clean energy. And, uh, the conservative, ITER, eh? clearly there is a global consensus, you know, that it will provide invaluable scientific and technological you know, information and demonstrate the feasibility of fusion for energy on the grid. And I can tell you that all the startups are actually following you know, closely eh? what is done at ITER. However, the route for meter to demo, and the first factor is long. And, and, and this is why this has been challenged you know, by the private sector to hit the market you know, earlier. So will this diverse uh, approach that I have no time to discuss them with you, be able to pass each uh, scale up set that we have to see? My feeling is that some of them, you know, look more, more, more credible, but it's hard to say uh, which technology will win. Uh, so my last word would be that fusion could be the key to a net uh, zero carbon economy, very sustainable. So it's important for, for Singapore you know, to keep abreast of how the field develops and be well prepared. So, thank you for your efforts. Thank you, Claude. Any questions? Uh, this was a very useful presentation. I think we have some questions. Yeah. So, uh, currently, fission is the commercial viable approach to 
all of France's energy is contributed by the And also a lot of China, the new uh, capacity they're building is using electric. So between now and 2060, like right? yes. uh, the only way to build reliable renewable power is efficient. That's yes, correct. Right. So I would say that the optimistic uh, software say no, no one says no to go and we will have a fusion device producing electricity. The optimistic software, the realistic optimistic software, say 2035, which is actually 10 years from now. And uh, so this is to compare to 2060, which is the conservative approach. Uh, so meanwhile, as you say, uh, fission is a solution, and fission today is producing 10% of the electricity worldwide, and it could be much more. And this is that it's developing in China, that's developing in India. France is starting uh, in the UN, UK is doing the same. So I think that in the nuclear fission, uh, of course, we probably grow. Okay, in the next year, but it is me. I mean, it is because I, I mentioned it because of the availability of the uranium. Uh, roughly speaking, if we had to consider as it is today, we have the uranium for our country. It will allow to farm uranium. And we're talking about like uh, commercial alternatives to fusion. Uh, I, I saw that the budget actually is pretty low, so for billion compared to what Hyper or CA is spending, is like quite small. Do they have alternatives to, uh, in terms of size, to sort of like a minimalistic approach in order to? I'm not sure. It was a pretty right? I'm sorry. Can you repeat the question again? So you mentioned the commercial. Uh, Prioritized approach to fusion with like a budget of $2.4 billion. Uh, my question is they must have a minimalistic approach to uh, make the claims of the type uh, deadline for like, I mean, for the next 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 for Yes, sorry, oh, sorry. So this is 2035 for the first operational reactor, right? Yeah. But the budget is much lower than the one on CA or the one on Hyper. The maximum was like 150 million. Yes. So they must have an alternative idea, like approach, in order to achieve that. If they know which direction is up for it, it can be very basic. I'm not sure. 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 I'm the possibility of having a, a working reactor without the funding that I have. What can I say is that, I mean, again, you see, to save approach uh, is what I call the control approach. Uh, it was designed, uh, I mean, maybe ITER is an international cooperation. USA, Europe, China, Korea, Russia, maybe some others. Uh, uh, so there, and this was designed in two parts. You have to define a very safe technology. And this is why they choose this narrow than uh, uh, low temperature superconductors. Everything you know, in a way, is very safe. 
And I think I trust that by 2035, 10 years, they will be able to read their code because this has really been constructed on a very safe, conservative basis. The, uh, the private sector are very different. The effect of new technologies. If I take common wealth, to the good tech, they say, we know, I mean, we know this uh, now 30 years, that some materials are superconducting at high temperature. And the price falls. And so what I've been able to do is to show that they can get this very high magnetic magnetic field is very important huh? because that will drive the power of the reactor and the ability to confine it in a smaller way. So all the ones I mentioned general fusion. General fusion is uh, beginning on something quite so crazy. Huh? Is that you know they would like to compress magnetized plasma with gas compressors, so mechanical uh, compression. This is very risky. We say we, we, many people have developed about it. And there are many others. Huh? So they are all independent. Huh? So my, my conclusion was we the conservative approach to make the good one of we one of these uh, 30 uh, alternative approaches. One of two of them. It's actually, I and mean, I suppose many of them will just fail yeah. because it's too uh, observers, yeah. it's possible. Is it what you want? Yes, thank you. Claude, excuse me, we have a question online from uh, Adrien, Adrien Ducharme. Adrian, do you want to? Uh... Yeah, hi, hi everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, so yeah, I had a question uh, for you. Uh, uh, so my question was: Should we focus entirely on uh, nuclear fission while waiting for fusion, because to limit our uh, GHG uh, emissions, like such as Germany, they switched back to to coal, and I think that's not a way to go. So what is your take on that? Should we go all in on nuclear fission? while waiting for fusion to to come in or, or not thank you for for that well again i mean it, it, it's uh, uh, the answer depends very much on where you are yeah? and uh, in, if i take the example of uh, countries which i've mentioned uh, like france uh, like uk like uh, china of course, we will not wait for fusion. Yeah? And, and, and we are betting, we are not betting, we know that fission uh, works yeah? and, and, and fission is safe, but fission, you know, has and some uh, issues, which are very small issues, because I've said uh, uh, the, the probability of an accident is extremely, that is very, uh, but you cannot preclude that such an accident cannot happen. You can say that it will not happen. So uh, a, a nuclear fission accident in Singapore would have immense consequences, definitely. So, you know, the situation depends very much on uh, where you are uh, staying because Singapore says fission may be an option if we are sure that you know, and that's why they, think they, they mentioned small modular reactor that safety uh, is ensured. So, but as a rule over the world, I think clearly uh, there is a time for fission, uh, and hopefully this will be followed by fusion. But fusion today will not stop, I mean, fission, because <laughs> the main reason is that there is no fusion reactor. To, in nowhere. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup. Okay. 
it is the main risk of fusion. Yes, uh, you know, it's always said that uh, fusion has no risk, it's, uh, it's absolutely perfect. No, nothing is perfect. The risk of, I mean, there are two things with fusion. I mentioned tritium. Tritium is, is quite nasty uh, because it's a uh, hydrogen isotope. So it's a very light element. And like hydrogen, it permeates in all matter. So safety, nuclear safety for tritium is an issue which is important. And I can tell you, I've seen it, people work very hard on this. Because we will produce the tritium inside the reactor. We have to extract it. We have to make sure that there is no tritium needed. So I think this, this is one issue. And we have the same thing with actually uh, nuclear fission. Because there is fission means also from nuclear reactors. That's one thing. And the second thing, uh, we said there is no uh, waste to get uh, radioactive legacy. This is partly true. There is no highly radioactive uh, waste like in fission. And because fission produces elements which are which will stay for 100,000 million years. This is not the case in future. That the structural materials, you know, which are forming the uh, reactor, are irradiated uh, with fast neutron. And, and in fact, neutrons which are more energetic than neutrons. So these materials will be irradiated. That's not a big issue. Huh? In fact, uh, we have this also with nuclear fission, and, and, and we call this you know, low radioactive elements, and they are very easy to uh, store. And, uh, but that's a very old situation. And that's a too safety issue with uh, There is no risk, I and mean, there is no chain reaction. Uh, uh, you can't do the control of your reactor. So your, your reactor can, yes. can just get the heat. No, no, because uh, I mean, uh, if there is any loss huh, of reactivity, then it can just uh, stop. Just if I may ask, uh, so you talked about hydrogen and hydrogen. You know, a lot of investment is going into hydrogen as a fuel, and in particular, the whole question of uh, building uh, storage and uh, transmission. Yes. Do you think there is a chance that that could be then transported to make fusion more commercially viable? Because a lot of investment is going to making hydrogen viable. So hydrogen? Yeah. No, I mean the, the technology, particularly to transport and store. Yes. Do you think there is a possibility of portability of that into the to make more easy to Yeah, it's yeah. I don't see the other one. But there is a possibility that hydrogen will become a renewable source. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but you know, you know the hydrogen is not a renewable, it's not a linear, it's a vector. And you have to produce hydrogen. Yeah? And, uh, and if you want to have clean hydrogen, you have to produce the renewable energy. And uh, of course, nuclear energy is a very good way to produce hydrogen. And I think, you know, if you think of a carbon free economy, yeah? of course, you should use an if hydrogen thing to be used for self uh, fuels. And for transport for boats, aeroplanes, I mean, of course, it could be produced either by fission or by fusion. It's a more difficult question. It's about the. Can you put, you know, I, I, in fact, I, I approach I, I, it's like this, but I'm a little bit deaf. <laughs> It's about the how do you transfer 
the energy from the inside of the chamber, which is that the outside of the safety containment. The field, the radiations, so you need like really strong and durable material from the inside of the chamber. So how is the energy transfer done? So yeah, I mean yeah. transfer. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, of course, yeah, energy has to be uh, with the heat has to be transferred. Uh, and the technology is prepared a little direct to a different part uh, of the uh, uh, surrounding materials, uh, which will extract uh, the energy. And then uh, the fusion reactor is just like a fusion reactor, it's a thermal machine. Uh, the, the, the heat of fluid, uh, and you have the exchange, the and then you still activate uh, turbine uh, uh, at the end to produce uh, electricity. It's, it's a thermal machine. So you will lose, like a efficient reactor, the thermal efficiency. Thank you very much, Claude. Thank you, thank you. for the Thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you all for attending online. So we sent a survey online. Uh, I think for people on the side, we will see that in there. But if you can uh, give us your feedback on the session from today, and also if you have any topics that you would like to hear for other French lab, or if you would like also to be a speaker or so, please feel to find your voice. Uh, thank you again. I wish you a very good weekend, long weekend, and uh, see you very soon in the next French lab. Thank you. Four years back.